Hi everyone, I'm here today to introduce you all to a unique new approach for dealing with and potentially solving both climate change and a wide swath of modern problems both environmental and economic. It involves both a new technology as well as a strong commitment to careful and intensive managing of plant life worldwide. You haven't seen this plan before in the mainstream media. It's been under the radar so far, and some of it for very good reason. The five steps constitute a whole system strategy that can be roughly summarized here on this chart that I'll briefly explain before going into details. Okay, so let's have a quick look at this chart. The first of the five items here involves a new technology. For now, we'll call it net hydrogen fuel because it's basically a new way to package hydrogen that retains all the advantages of hydrogen without any of the traditional disadvantages. It's basically hydrogen without the hassles. And so promising and potentially game-changing is this new fuel that we need to find out very quickly, ideally in a U.S. government national laboratory, if it really works. The second item is pretty straightforward and blunt. To solve climate change, we need to plant a trillion trees in the world. Fortunately, this is not something that needs to be initiated. There's already an international plant a trillion trees movement underway. The story about how that movement got started is amazing in itself, but we'll get to that a little later. The third item specifies what kind of trees need to be planted. Simply stated, we need high-performance trees and plants. The polonia tree is listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the fastest-growing tree in the world. It sucks in more atmospheric carbon dioxide by far than any other tree. There are also now new agronomy techniques to make these and other plants grow even faster. We need to plant high numbers of these super trees and plants. Our fourth item combines the first three. We grow these special polonia trees on plantations worldwide, then harvest them after three to five years, then use the parts of the tree to make both net hydrogen and a new generation of high-tech carbon fiber and graphene-based products. The fifth and final item is the culmination of the previous four. We methodically convert the 1.3 billion internal combustion engines in the world today to run on this new zero-emission net hydrogen fuel. If we did all this, we'd not only be solving huge environmental problems, including perhaps the biggest of all, climate change, but huge economic problems as well. Just so you know, my background experience leading up to this five-step plan is highly mixed. My undergraduate education was in urban planning and renewable energy. My graduate school study started with life sciences, then education and cognitive science. My doctorate degree and follow-up professional experience has been centered on either science education, mostly physics, or computer graphics for urban design, mostly public transportation planning. I got into hydrogen by writing two books about solar hydrogen-powered trains. My hope now is that such a mixed background as I've just described is appropriate for the unique challenge of finding viable and balanced solutions to a dilemma as multidisciplinary as climate change. Okay, let's talk about these five climate change solution steps in more detail. I want to start this off with a nine-minute video that I made a while back about this revolutionary new net hydrogen fuel. I call it the Metrol movie, because the Arizona company that is developing the fuel calls it Metrol. It's available on YouTube, so you can look at it online anytime later. Here we go. There's something new on the renewable energy front, something you probably haven't heard of, and something under the radar. Most importantly, it's something that could potentially solve huge problems, including perhaps even the biggest of all problems, climate change. This new thing is called Metrol. It's a clean and green, affordable, and easy to obtain, easy to use liquid transportation fuel based on hydrogen with the unmatched potential to quickly and completely replace all forms of fossil fuel. To understand the full importance of Metrol requires that we face up to what it would take to actually solve climate change. It's basically two tasks. First, we need to stop emitting industrial carbon gases into the atmosphere. Second, we need to remove already existing carbon gases in significant amounts from the atmosphere. Amazingly, Metrol can do both. 
We also have to find a way to stop polluting our landscapes and oceans with our waste. Metrol can do this too. The full list of benefits for the Metrol technology system would seem to make it the proverbial no-brainer. The METROL program was developed by an Arizona research group known as McAllister Technologies. The company's director, Roy McAllister, a professional engineer with over 250 patents in renewable energy, founded the American Hydrogen Association, wrote a book called The Solar Hydrogen Civilization, has taught in the engineering departments at University of Kansas and Arizona State University, and has received awards from prominent professional engineering societies for innovations in green energy. We use a relatively small amount of electricity to ionize a portion of the population of injected fuel so that these ions carry on the ignition. These ions go where the fuel goes. And so we're, in, in that sense, extremely efficient. And the way we present the fuel then is as a stratified charge. So we'll... Metrol is made from anything that rots or burns. This typically means biomass waste such as sewage, garbage, farm waste, or forest waste. Metrol could also be made from fossil fuel. When made from biomass, an anaerobic digester is used to extract from it the methane gas. Then, and unlike other biofuels which typically just use the methane as a fuel, metrol production takes it a step further by splitting the methane into its constituent parts, hydrogen and carbon. The solid carbon is collected and then sold to industry as a manufacturing resource. The hydrogen gas is collected and, by use of a patented process, combined with nitrogen and carbon dioxide drawn from the atmosphere to form a three-element liquid fuel, metrol. Because it's a liquid at room temperature and pressure, it's as easy to store and transport as gasoline, diesel, or jet fuel. This means we don't have to build massive new infrastructure to handle the hydrogen-based fuel. It can use existing pipelines, rail cars, tanker trucks, and gas stations, thus saving huge amounts of money. Once the liquid metrol is inside a converted car, truck, or literally any other type of motor vehicle with an internal combustion engine, it's stored in a standard fuel tank. Next, in using patented McAllister technology, the metrol is heated and pressurized using recycled waste heat from the combustion chamber. The hydrogen is then separated out from the metrol and cleanly burned. The leftover carbon and nitrogen are released back to the atmosphere from which they were earlier drawn during the making of the metrol. Converting a normal car engine to metrol use typically takes about the same amount of time as a standard tune-up. The existing exhaust system is replaced by the metrol heat exchanger. The hydrogen accumulator is mounted nearby on the firewall, and the new smart plugs simply replace the old spark plugs. In many ways, Metrol cars and trucks are the greenest of all road vehicles. To understand why, we start with the most immediate, easy to see factors. First up, Metrol vehicles are obviously cleaner than those running on either gasoline or diesel and this is by a huge margin. Besides no toxic tailpipe emissions, as we'll see, they actually clean the air. Metrol fuels are also easier on the engine than is gasoline or diesel fuel, so the vehicle engines last longer. Metrol cars are cleaner than other biofuel cars because they burn only hydrogen, not the carbon that's in methane or biodiesel. Metrol cars are cleaner than typical electric cars because they don't depend on either the grid, which is mostly fossil fuel powered, or on toxic batteries. Metro cars have multi-fuel flexibility. They can run on either metrol or, if necessary, gasoline or diesel with the flip of a switch. Metro cars have lower costs overall compared to other green car types and compared sometimes even to gasoline cars. This is for two important reasons. First, Converting existing cars to metrol is much cheaper than buying a new car. Second, implementing the metrol infrastructure is much cheaper than all the other energy alternatives. There are bigger issues that make metrol even more attractive. For example, metrol burning engines actually suck in and remove contaminants from the intake air. 
This means a metrol vehicle actually cleans the air that it drives through. With metrol use replacing fossil fuels in cars, trucks, and power plants, we could virtually eliminate smog from the cities of the world. Even more important, metrol production from biomass could enable the world's green plants to remove excess CO2 from the atmosphere. This is because biomass is made from photosynthesis. And photosynthesis naturally captures carbon from the air and puts it into plants. When animals or plants die, that biomass normally either rots or burns, thus returning the captured carbon back to the atmosphere. But because the metrol system interrupts the rotting or burning of biomass, it prevents some captured carbon from returning to the atmosphere. This carbon is instead separated out from the biomass, stockpiled, and sold to manufacturing industries to make durable goods. This essentially locks the carbon in a place where it does no harm. The net effect of this process could be huge, enough for existing green plants to significantly lower and restabilize atmospheric CO2 levels. It's been calculated that we could potentially lower worldwide CO2 parts per million counts to safe levels within 20 years. One final metrol benefit is to dispose of our waste products in a non-polluting way. Our garbage, sewage, and farm waste, etc., thereby become valuable resources instead of pollution headaches. The key to the affordability of metrol comes from the captured carbon sold by the pound to industry as a manufacturing resource. The income potential of this is shown here, where we can see that a given amount of natural gas or methane yields 14 times as much income when made into metrol than when simply sold or burned as we do now. This income from carbon sales can be used to subsidize both the cost of engine conversions and the per gallon cost of metrol at the pump. The captured carbon sold to industry makes possible widespread use of a growing new class of wonder materials such as carbon fiber, graphene, and carbon nanotubes. The superior quality goods produced include car bodies, bicycles, airplanes, and space vehicles and to a new generation of much more efficient wind turbines and solar panels. This last point greatly amplifies the indirect capacity of Metrol to supply clean energy for the world. Right now there are working prototypes for both the Metrol production equipment and the engine conversion kit that need to be advanced into production prototypes. With seed money, the next key step will be intensive third-party testing and certification to validate the reliability of the Metrol technology. This will be followed by ramp-up of production capacity to first stage commercialization, which will take place in a few pilot programs around the country. Finally, with press coverage, word of mouth, and public demand, full-scale implementation of Metrol can begin, and the environmental plus economic benefits to motorists, travelers, and the energy-using public in general, along with virtually all other life on Earth, would be almost immediate. It all depends on the public and political will to step up to the plate and actually solve the key problems of our time. Now I can tell you right off that while many people are very intrigued by this video, there are also quite a few who see this movie and simply don't believe it. You know how there's an old saying that if something sounds too good to be true, it's usually not true? Please note that the operational word here is usually, and there are sometimes exceptions to such rules. One friend of mine showed it to a chemist who simply said, it sounds like BS. My friend thought I'd be offended to hear this, but I wasn't. I said, you know what? He's right. It sort of does sound like BS. But guess what? That's how game-changing innovations inherently tend to sound. The key follow-up question for this chemist should be this. Hey, what if it's not BS? What if it's for real? Consider the implications. With something this promising on so many levels, and in a time of such great need for a clean, cheap, and unlimited supply energy source, can we afford not to explore it just a little closer? This is precisely why Metrol needs to be tested out quickly and decisively by third-party engineering analysis, ASAP. We'll talk about such testing in just a little bit. Right now, I'd like to review two of the key ideas of what you just saw in the video. 
The first key idea in metrol technology is a basic reliance on natural processes rather than machines to capture carbon from the atmosphere. By focusing on biomass, we can harness the power of photosynthesis to do the work for us. That's why we call it an organic solution. We fortunately don't need to build great multitudes of the giant machines like this one shown here that suck in air like a vacuum cleaner to remove atmospheric carbon. If we play our cards right, the trees and plants of the world can do most of the work. This means huge savings in the amount of money required to achieve significantly lower carbon levels in the atmosphere. Another key idea in the movie involves obtaining methane from either biomass or fossil fuel sources and then splitting that methane in a new, uniquely clean and affordable way. The net result is that we create both pure hydrogen for fuel as well as solid carbon for next generation industrial manufacturing of durable goods. Splitting methane is nothing new. The fossil fuel industry has been doing it for at least 80 years with a process called steam methane reformation. What's new is being able to do it with a patented new process called thermal dissociation that is a much less expensive than the old method and b much cleaner than the old method. It has zero harmful byproducts like gaseous carbon dioxide which as most of you know is a harmful greenhouse gas. The new process yields solid carbon which is optimized for making as the movie discussed carbon fiber for durable goods. Our second step of the five-step climate solution involves the Plant a Trillion Trees program that had its roots in an unlikely place. You might have heard about this amazing German teenager, Felix Finkbeiner, who 10 years ago in the fourth grade did a wildly ambitious science fair project for his school in Bavaria based on a plan to plant a million trees in Germany. Because of his youth and the boldness of his plan, the story caught the attention of the German media which spurred on the movement even more until it attained national and then international recognition. Not only did they succeed in their initial goal, it expanded into an international movement to plant a million trees in countries worldwide. Long story short, the movement that Felix started has now, as of 2018, planted over 15 billion, that's B as in boy, trees worldwide. It's one of the rare eco-success stories of our time, and it's so refreshing to see this new generation taking such initiative. One of Felix's most notable quotes is the motto for his group, Stop talking, start planting. Another is, a monkey will always choose one banana now versus six bananas later. Our leaders right now are acting a little like monkeys. The success of this tree planting movement prompted another group based at Yale University to do an audit of roughly how many trees there are in the world. They came to the conclusion, based on very specific criteria as to what constitutes a tree, that there are now about 3 trillion trees on planet Earth, give or take 150 billion, and that there used to be 6 trillion trees in prehistoric times. They also came to the conclusion that based on current land availability constraints due to agriculture and suitable growing habitat, that there is today room for a trillion more. Thus began the Trillion Tree Movement, which you can get more details on by simply googling the words Trillion Trees. But besides the quantity of trees, we also need to be focusing on the quality of the trees to be planted. Let's look closely now at this new wonder tree mentioned earlier, called the Polonian, or one of its subspecies. Simply stated, this is the fastest growing tree in the world, folks. It can grow 15 feet a year, that's half an inch a day. In only five years it can be 60 feet tall with a trunk one foot in diameter, big enough to harvest for lumber operations. What's more, it can be modified to grow even faster, as shown in these photos displaying polyploid tree technology. Because it grows so fast and creates so much biomass, it also captures, by far, more carbon out of the atmosphere than any other tree in the world. The uniqueness and value of the polonia tree is starting to be widely recognized in locations around the world. In Europe, widespread polonia plantations can now be seen in Germany and Switzerland. In South America, large swaths of former rainforest that were formerly cut down are now being replanted with polonia trees. Much of the hype about the polonia tree is purely economic, 
If you do a Google search on Polonia Investment, you'll find many articles talking about how much profit can be made from Polonia tree plantations. That the trees grow so fast that they can be harvested after only a few years to produce very high quality, hence high profit, lumber that can be used for making furniture and musical instruments. The fact that the leaves and branches can be made into ultra-clean fuel, not to mention new carbon-based wonder materials for manufacturing, is barely talked about at all. By the way, these leaves and branches can also be made into biochar, a new type of charcoal that is a super fertilizer that simultaneously locks carbon into the soil for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. To conclude our third step, then, as concern about the climate situation grows, the significance and importance of the polonia tree is going to increase quickly, especially when it's combined with other developments like net hydrogen technology, as well as biochar, composting, and other soil conservation practices that aggressively promote soil health. The fourth step in our overall five-step program is combining all the above steps. Simply stated, this means make metrol in massive amounts by any of several methods. One of the best things about metrol is that it's so flexible. It can be made from polonia trees or any other biomass source such as forest slash, garbage, sewage, farm waste, or food waste. It can also be made from renewable energy such as solar or wind power, hydroelectric, or geothermal power. It can also be made from fossil fuels like natural gas, oil, coal, and in doing so, it effectively detoxifies these fuels when they're burned. Remember that one of our mottos is no more burning of carbon because carbon is too profitable to burn. On a side note, making metrol from oil or coal might not be a good idea, but making it from natural gas might be a great idea. This is because the needed gas pipeline infrastructure is already there and oil companies could A, easily transition to metrol, and B, continue making big profits. As I said before, metrol is a new way to package hydrogen so that it's affordable, easy to store and transport, and completely safe to use. Think of it as hydrogen 2.0, or hydrogen without the hassles. It retains all the advantages of hydrogen, but avoids all of the traditional disadvantages that naysayers of hydrogen have been harping on for years. Besides the fact that it's so clean, one of the most compelling things about metrol is that because it's a liquid at room temperature, we don't have to spend huge amounts of money on new fuel infrastructure or new battery infrastructure. We could change over to metrol technology much faster than any other energy alternative. Then there's the carbon. The other major idea from the movie describes what to do with the captured carbon split off from the methane now that it's no longer burned. Instead of burying it in the ground, as is usually proposed, there's apparently an amazing amount of profit to be made from marketing that carbon to industry in a brand new patented way. The movie stated that the profits from carbon fiber and graphene products could subsidize all the costs of implementing metrol technology. The underlying secret to this is that the new methane splitting process yields specialized optimized carbon that could cut the cost of making carbon fiber in half. There is now broad consensus among industry analysts that such a price change would revolutionize the carbon fiber industry and make it go viral worldwide. The fifth and final step in our five-step climate solution and the way to have net hydrogen metrol fuel make its mark on history will be to apply it to supplying electricity and motive power to the world. There are currently 1.3 billion internal combustion engines in the world and growing. Most of them are cars and trucks, but there's also trains, ships, airplanes, and power plants large and small. The goal now should be to convert as many of these engines as possible to burn zero emissions metrol. Such conversions could be done for cars in only a few hours each and would cost only a small fraction of the purchase price of a new electric car. On top of that, as the movie described, internal combustion engines burning metrol hydrogen actually clean the air that they drive through. This makes metrol better than a zero emissions fuel. It becomes a minus emissions fuel. We could literally eliminate smog from the cities of the world. Hydrogen talk was big 10-15 years ago, but then fell quiet. 
Now it's back. While many in the meantime had concluded that battery electric cars are the way to go, the facts now say differently. It turns out that because metrol net hydrogen can power fuel cells as well as internal combustion engines, the best kind of electric motor vehicle will also be metrol fueled. The benefits of this five-step program have already been partially and separately listed. They can be summarized as follows. 1. Climate restoration. This is from tree and biomass-based massive carbon capture causing dramatic reduction in atmospheric carbon. 2. Smog elimination. From hydrogen burning engines that actually clean the surrounding air. 3. Limitless clean affordable energy. This is from multiple abundant sources of hydrogen. 4. The end of most land and water pollution by turning most waste into energy generating feedstock. 5. Fresh water production and reclamation. Since H2 is part of H2O, in a hydrogen economy there's abundant clean water everywhere. 6. Industrial carbon revolution. From capitalizing on captured carbon to make carbon fiber and graphene. And 7. Sustainable prosperity. Converting to the new green infrastructure will create millions of quality new jobs worldwide. Now let's look at the big picture. Among other things, this means looking at the alternatives. One of the most comprehensive treatments on this topic of climate crisis solutions is in a book that came out last year. It's called Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. It's edited by Paul Hawken. This is a great resource. It's an excellent book for getting an overview of the pieces of the climate solution puzzle. I highly recommend it. However, there's a caveat. While it shows us the pieces, it doesn't show us a whole unifying vision. And some of the key pieces of the puzzle are unfortunately missing. For example, it barely mentions hydrogen, and it doesn't mention polonia trees at all. Hopefully the next edition will fix that, because what we really need at this point is as follows. We need a central, inspiring, unifying vision. This vision should be both technology-based and plant-based. It's a matter of balance. We also need to be shown a way to pay for it. So far, the Metro five-step vision I've just presented is the only one that I've seen that fits these criteria. And right now, Metro energy technology appears to be more powerful and far-reaching than any other green alternative seen. I'm willing to be wrong about this. I invite and challenge anyone to counter what I've described here in a public forum. We need widespread open public dialogue on this topic. Okay, so where do we stand? Let's put it out on the table right now and acknowledge that this is an unusual situation, folks, especially the part about Metrol technology. We've got a highly talented independent inventor with a potentially game-changing set of patented inventions. Because it's disruptive technology in the most classic sense of the term, and with entrenched energy interests having so much power as they do, there are major obstacles faced here. But as mentioned earlier, with the stakes now being what they are, we clearly can't afford to wait any longer for new technology to be fully tested before giving it a chance. Sometimes there's a need to go outside the box and take a chance on a wildcard factor. This would seem to be one of those times. One good thing is that this technology seems to be bipartisan. Because of the monetary profit potential of Metrol technology, some of its strongest supporters are Republicans. This is important because besides seed money, one of the key things that Metrol technology needs right now is broad-based grassroots support. If you like what you've heard here today, please go to the Metrol website and see how you can take part. Thanks so much for coming. I can now take some questions.